Robbie. In this video, we're going to look at some of the industry context for Late Night Bombazal by looking at the BBC, its history, and its roles as a public service broadcaster. Alright, we've got a brief potted history of the BBC as a radio broadcaster here. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, pause the video, read it yourself. But basic information is obviously it's the oldest broadcaster in the world. It is the first ever radio broadcaster. It is the first ever broadcaster of television. It's been broadcasting since the 18th of October, 19, well, set up on the 18th of October, 1922, to broadcast since the 14th of November, 1922. So it's coming up to 100 years old. The names of Radio 1234 date back to 1967. Back then, there were no commercial stations, there were no commercial radio in the UK until 1973. So they were the only radio channels that were available. And it wasn't until 1967 that the UK first started broadcasting legally pop music was done on Radio 1. Before then, you had to get really pop music you could get in the UK was by tuning into Radio Luxembourg, which, as the name implies, was being broadcast on Luxembourg, or you listen to Pirate Radio, it was a boat called Caroline, which was parked on international waters and would broadcast pop music. So you tune in to listen to pop music and do this and get it. On pirate radio, to show what it's called, what they want. Anyway, um, if you look at when broadcasting started to go digital, we're looking at 1995, it started to roll out digital channels, and the BBC were also very um, sort of like pioneering in. Convergence and the internet, where they started broadcasting a live stream on the internet of Radio 1 as long ago as 1996. So, pioneers in that. But as I said, I'm not going to go into that detail and read that yourself. But we're going to be in the background so when next door neighbors are an extension bed. Sorry. Um, yeah, again. You don't have to listen, know too much about this in detail. As I said, DAB has been broadcast since September 1995, that's when it went digital. Before that, it had been analog. Digital audio broadcasting or DAB is still broadcast through the airwaves as a radio signal, which is picked up by an aerial on your radio. Okay? Whether that radio will be in your car or in a home, it doesn't matter, it's the same principle. The difference between analog and digital, because analog radio was broadcast as a radio signal through the air, but digital radio broadcasts a digital signal. In other words, the radio show is being broadcast as computer data, which is then interpreted by your dad radio, which is basically a computer. Right? So, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about digital versus analog technologies. Digital technologies are those that are computer based. They are computer information. Right? CDs, DVDs, Blu rays. These are all digital technologies. Right? Free view television is digital. Satellite cable television is digital. It used to be analog, they've gone. We don't have them on analog anymore. There's no analog TV in this country and hasn't been since 2010. We still have analog radio. Obviously, anything that involves a computer, a streaming service, Spotify, Netflix, Deezer, Amazon Prime, Apple Music, or whatever, they're all digital, obviously, because they're on the computer, right? Um, so, for the technology side of it, because it's digital, it doesn't have to just come across the airwaves. 
we can listen to the radio on smart devices, not just on DAB radios. Okay? DAB, well, it's complicated. It's better than AM radio, but sound quality isn't as good as FM radio. Um, the difference is, is that FM radio can be really, really good quality, but it depends on the strength of your signal. Whereas digital radio is either perfect or you can't get it at all. So, most people aren't going to know the difference, okay. Right? Um, you know, back in, I mean, it's figures from 2017. Um, which is more around when the late night was always being broadcast, but you know, pretty much 48, nearly 49 percent of all radio listening back in the third quarter of 2017 was on a digital platform. It's got up since then. Um, the majority of digital radio listening, 73 percent, and 61 percent of UK households came from access to DAB radio set. So, you know. DAB is the predominant way in which people listen to the radio in these cars. Um, if we look at this, this is from March 2020. As you can see, it's quite high percentage wise. Right? There are about 55 million people. We've got access to radio in this country, of which 48 million, 49 million of them are listening to radio. It's an 89% reach. So a lot of people listen to the radio. You might not do. Young people are less likely to listen to it. But you probably think about it and listening to it whether you know it or not. Maybe your parents have got it on in the kitchen in the morning when they're cooking breakfast. Maybe it's on in the car when you're on the way to work or on the way to college. Maybe, you know, it's on where you work. Maybe you work in a shop, maybe you work in co-op and they've got co-op radio on all day. You know, maybe you, I don't know, you know, lots of stores on their own radio, don't they? Right, not just supermarkets. Um, you know, HMV, for example, those got its own radio stations, though it still does. On average, uh, people listening to, you know, 17 to 20 hours of radio a day. Right? So, it's a big deal. You know, Radio 4 is listening to about, you know, 10 or 3 quarter million people. It's got a big audience. Now, as well as the DAB radio stations, oh sorry, the Public Service Broadcasting Radio Station, BBC, there are also commercial DAB stations, almost the Digital One Network. These are nationwide, national digital radio stations. In other words, you can get these everywhere. So we've got Smooth Extra, Capital Extra, uh, which is dance music, urban, stuff like that, Classical FM, which is classical music. It says FM in this name, but it's not digital. But that's the radio, we've got KISS, we've got Magic, Talk Sports, Radio X, uh, UCB UK, Part 80s, um, LBC, which is a talk radio. Uh, you've got Part Extra and you've got Capital FM, which is also broadcast digital as well as on FM. They're available everywhere in the UK. Where we are in South Yorkshire, you've also got our local commercial radio stations. Uh, they're only available in South Yorkshire, so around Sheffield, basically. So we've got Absolute Radio, which is a classic rock after the radio in the 90s. You've also got Hallam FM, um, Hallam 2, and Hallam Greatest Hits and Hits, stuff like that. So we've got our local commercial radio stations. Other areas of the country have their local radio stations. Um, the local digital radio multiplex is actually run by Bauer Media on Hallam FM. Is it called Bauer Media? I can't remember. But anyway. 
We've also got our South Yorkshire local BBC DAV station, so we've basically got a radio Sheffield, which is BBC broadcast of the entire South Yorkshire. Other than the other BBC digital stations, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., etc., we've also got the Asian network as well, broadcast in South Yorkshire. So, what are the different radio stations? Pause it, you can read this yourself, but quickly. BBC One is aimed at 15 to 29 year olds and it covers pop music principally, so top 40 pop music. Radio One Extra is hip hop and R&B aimed at 15 to 24 year olds, so principally black music. BBC Radio Two, big audience, 13 million people, covers pop music but for older audiences. Okay, so people in their 30s and 40s. We have a couple other stuff as well. Radio 3 is the highbrow arts and cultural broadcasting. There's a lot of classical music, but also jazz, and also speech programs, documentary drama. Radio 4, is what we're listening to, is a mixed speech radio station offering in-depth news and current affairs, wide range of other speech programs, including drama, readings, comedy, factual and magazine programs. Late Night Woman's Hour and Woman's Hour are magazine programs. Why are they called magazine programs? Because like a print magazine, they're made up of little bits. Magazines have articles, radio shows have features and whatever, I guess. But anyway, it's kind of a little bit. A lot of TV comedy starts off on Radio 4. Mighty Bush. Um, things like Today Today and um, I don't know, all sorts of stuff. It's all pretty. But BBC Radio 4 Extra um, is speech entertainment, comedy, readings, drama, old, a lot of drama, a lot of old radio drama. You know, even going back as far as the 30 and stuff like that. Radio Life Far Five Live is news, live sports coverage. Um, so news sport basically. Uh, Radio Five Live Sports Extra is sport. Radio Six is um, alternative spirit. It says they look alternative indie, hipstery kind of music essentially. Uh, Asian Network is Asian music. And other programming and output specifically to the Asian communities, and you've got your local radio too. The thing about digital radio is it had a bigger bandwidth, so you can have more stations than you could on analog AM FM radio. Now, the other thing about online radio, of course, is that it's online. Digital radio, being digital and computer information, can be broadcast online, either as catch-up or as simulcast. So, you know, there are 400 radio stations available on Radio Player, which is, as the name suggests, a website that plays radio. What well, used to be BBC iPlayer, which used to have TV and radio on it, then became BBC Radio iPlayer, and is now BBC Sounds, which is an app available for browsers, tablets, phablets, and smartphones. But it's the number one source for all audio BBC content. Whether that be radio shows, podcasts, comedy, drama, documentaries, whatever. So, obviously, Late Night Woman's Hour is available on BBC Sounds. Not to mention, of course, their own website. Now, think about DAB. This is interesting. This is going to Q1 of 2020. 
court appointment was in February, March, April. You think that most radio listening nowadays would be done on some kind of smart device, but you'd be wrong. Most radio is still listened to on a radio, whether that be when you have a phone, or whether that be in the car. So at least 69% of listening is still done on a radio. We tend to think nowadays that, you know, because we've got smartphones, because we've got tablets and smart TVs and you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and all this stuff, that most media consumption is done on a smart device. It's simply not the case. Most of it is still listened to in a traditional format. Most television viewing is still done on a television. Most television viewing is BBC ITV. Most radio listening is done on a radio. Younger people might be more likely to say, well, you know, I don't watch television. I only watch Netflix or Amazon Prime. I've even had students tell me that they don't even watch YouTube, they only watch TikToks. But, you know, most media consumption is still done in traditional broadcast formats. I know it's surprising, but it's true. So, 69% of radio listening is done on a radio. All digital radio uh, is also available on digital television. So whether that be on Freeview or on Sky or on cable, if you go up to the top end of the, um, the channels, you'll find radio. So some people listen to it on their television. Um, but a quarter of radio is now consumed on some kind of smart platform, whether that be a computer, like a laptop, or whether it be a tablet or whatever, that's going up. The big change is increasingly people are using smart devices. So by that we mean Amazon Echo or Google Play or any of these kind of like smart devices. Um, so apparently 18% of people say they use a voice activated smart speaker to listen to the radio, which of course is a very, very new thing because they've only been around for a few years. Where are people listening to the radio? 60% of people listen to the radio at home. 24% in a vehicle. And 16% at work or somewhere else. So, again, we tend to think, you might say, you, you do most of your radio listening in the car. Apparently not. Not according to the figures. But then, you're young. This is maybe going to be older people listen to it, I imagine. Listening to audio content in the car. Look at that. 68% of people who listen to the radio in the car are still doing it on AM, FM. Probably FM. Not digital at all. These presumably people who are driving older vehicles. Newer vehicles are more likely to have a DAB radio in them. 46% are listening to DAB radio. 24%, so pretty much a quarter of people, are still listening to music on CD, tape or mini disc. Got to admit, I'm one of these people. Whilst my car has got a DAB radio on it, I don't listen to radio, so I don't use that. It in theory, should be able to have an aux input and a... Um, Bluetooth, but I can't get to talk to my phone. I've got an iPhone 12 and my car stereo isn't configured to use an iPhone newer than an iPhone 5. So whilst I can connect it, it keeps stuttering, which makes it very annoying. 
So where traditionally you have to go back and listen to CDs like it was the 90s or something, imagine. But anyway, 14% of people who listen to music stored on their phones, in other words they downloaded it on something like iTunes and it's physically on, stored on their phone and they're using AUX or Bluetooth to listen to it. Um, only 8% are using streaming services. In other words, either they've got something like Spotify built into their car or they're using something like AUX or um, uh, USB connections or Bluetooth to sort of like stream Spotify or Apple Music or something like that into their car. So a very, very small amount. You'd think that'd be way higher, but apparently not. 4% of people are listening to podcasts. 3% are listening to FM radio on a mobile phone. Some phones do have an FM tuner in them. Although, they'd have to be really old. I, can't, I don't remember the last time a phone had an FM tuner in it. But apparently 3% of people are still doing that. 3% of people are using a digital radio app on a mobile phone. So in other words, they're using, let's say, um, BBC Sounds to get on their phone and then streaming that to their car stereo. It does seem pretty pointless unless you're time shifting it, unless you're doing catch up. Those are the people who could be listening to the Late Night Woman's Hour. You see, see what I'm thinking? 11 o'clock at night, they were too tired to listen to it live. So they'll say, you know what, I'll listen to the car on the way to work in the morning. They get Sounds app on their phone start playing it, stream it to their car stereo. But that's only 3% of people, so it must be quite rare. Plus you'd have to have a pretty new car stereo. Um, like a pretty new car, unless you've attacked, you know, replaced your old car stereo with a new one. In your old car. Right, anyway, that's what I'm thinking though, that bottom 3%, they could be using, like, iPlayer, not iPlayer, sounds to listen to Late Night Woman's Hour in a car. But then again, we're talking shows that were broadcast five or six years ago. Do you know what I mean? How many people had cars in those days that could do that? Hmm. Good question. Don't know the answer to that. The point is here though, um, there's a very good chance if you're going to get a question about late night woman's hour, it'll be about convergence, or it'll be about how people listen to it, or it'll, you know it'll be about how technology has changed the way in which people can consume radio. This is why we're doing this facts, figures, statistics to back up your argument. Um, look at this weekly reach of UK radio stations. BBC Radio 4, as you can see, skews to an older ABC1 audience. Right? We know that. It's nothing new. But it's a nice little infographic to show it. Now, the other thing, of course, is you might get a question that asks about the national and global or international audiences. Now, iPlayer. Right? Here's a question I got off the FAQ page of the BBC. Can I use BBC iPlayer when I'm outside of the UK? Due to rights agreements, you need to be in the UK to stream or download programs and watch BBC TV channels on iPlayer. But if you download a program on BBC iPlayer in the UK, you can watch it anywhere in the world. You can download programs on a computer, tablet or mobile. Now. You can't watch television programs on BBC iPlayer if you're outside the UK. But you can get a radio. BBC Sounds, BBC Podcasts, BBC News, BBC Sports, and BBC Three YouTube channel, and any other channels that are on YouTube, 
are all available internationally. So in theory, anyone anywhere in the world could listen to Woman's Hour or Late Night Woman's Hour via BBC Sounds should they want to. So, BBC Sounds is accessible by a global audience. Would foreigners want to listen to it? Maybe. But expats are probably the audience who are going to be listening to it. As we said, BBC programmes are also available as podcasts or in a podcast style format. So, you can go to iPlayer Radio or Sounds, as it's now called, and listen to Late Night Woman's Hour. You can go to Late Night Woman's Hour's website and download or stream the programmes from there, just like we do in class. It's available on iTunes or Apple Radio nowadays, you want to call it. Um, so you can listen to it in all sorts of different platforms online. When iPlayer, sorry, when um, BBC Nightmare Woman's Hour was still being broadcast, as you can see, it was getting quite high listening figures. Uh, for 21st of November 2017, it charted at number 11 on the 23rd of November 2017, and it reached number 1 on the iTunes chart. So it was obviously pretty popular. As we can see, for that week, on the iTunes chart, it was at number 12 when I screenshotted this a few years ago. It was not in 2020 actually. So, Woman's Hour, the Ordinary Woman's Hour, this is not Late Night Woman's Hour, the Ordinary Woman's Hour is at number 19 in the UK in the podcast chart on iTunes in January 2020. So, if you look at the current seating here, Technological Convergence. David Butler came up with the term called technological convergence, by the way. Technological convergence, cheap software, hardware, and an abundance of distribution platforms have all made podcasting hugely popular and successful. Don't know about you, I love a podcast. I listen to lots of podcasts, love them. I'm particularly obsessed with the evolution of horror podcasts at the moment. The proliferation of podcasts across a wide range of topics and genres in recent years due to relatively low production costs of the medium and the unexpected hosting and digital distribution costs offers producers and people who are often prosumers, so they're producers and consumers and they're maybe semi-professional opportunity to take risks and develop adventurous content and still manages to reach diverse international audiences they often cover topics that would appeal to niche audiences but commercial radio cannot because they're not profitable enough there is a massive explosion of podcasts lately. Every man and his dog has a podcast. Increasingly more and more famous people are doing podcasts, more and more celebrities. But it's also something that anyone can do. Anyone can start a podcast about any topic you want. Because it's cheap and easy to do and it's easy to distribute and you've got an international audience. So, whatever obscure niche topic you can think of there's probably a podcast for it so as a podcast something like woman's hour and in more particular late now woman's hour is going to get a really big audience if we look at this for example um like no such thing as a fish is a spin-off podcast of the bbc television program QI. Things like um, Friday Night Comedy from BBC Radio 4, number 6 on the iTunes chart that week. Um, Desert Island Discs is another Radio 4 program that was at number 10. Komodo Mayo Film Review, the most listened to radio, uh, film show in the world. That's a podcast on BBC Radio 5 live every Friday, number 11 on the list. So there's a lot of BBC stuff. The Archers, a BBC Radio 4 sitcom, oh sorry, sitcom, soap opera, number 17. Alright, so a lot 
of BBC content on there. There are actually radio shows that we listen to like a podcast. So, it really shows you how there's been a sort of like a diversification where radio is now being treated like a podcast. This is catch-up. This is out-of-cart downloading. It's not simulcast, probably, I'd imagine. Although you can simulcast it. But why would you bother to do that on Sounds app? So, as I said, it can be argued that Late Night Woman's Hour challenges the idea that the leader is controlled by a small number of companies driven by logic and power. We've done this before. Um, it did it fit the public service broadcasting um, remit and it's very much at odds with that profit and power. Late Night Woman's Hour is not a show that's going to have a huge audience. It's not going to be particularly profitable on a commercial channel. They wouldn't do it. But the license fee frees the BBC from the need to make profit so they can be more diverse, they've got more freedom, they can be more niche, they don't have to worry about, you know, pleasing advertisers. They don't have to worry about being profitable. So you can say that it challenges current and Seaton. But you can also say that public service broadcasting and shows like Late Night Woman's Hour support current and Seaton's claim that socially diverse patterns of ownership create conditions for more varied and adventurous productions. As I said, no commercial comp radio station would make anything like Late Night Woman's Hour. It's not profitable or commercial enough. Think about the public service remit. Inform, educate, entertain. Late Night Woman's Hour ticks all three boxes. It's informative, it's education, it's done in an entertaining manner. Um, remember that the license fee pays for all nine BBC television channels. The BBC Three, which is online, all regional programming, ten national radio stations, forty local radio stations, and BBC.co.uk and the Red Button Interactive Services. It does not carry any advertising. It is not for profit. That does not mean that there isn't a commercial win for the BBC that sells BBC products abroad and produces things like DVDs and Blu-rays of their programmes and CDs and all that kind of stuff. Not to mention they own a load of channels on Freeview as well. So, the BBC's five public purposes are set out by the Royal Charter and Agreement to the constitutional basis the BBC has presented to Parliament. So the BBC has these sort of like things that it has to do. It has a reason for existing. These purposes outline the values the BBC holds when it strives to achieve its mission to inform, educate and entertain. Right. First of all, they have to provide impartial news and information to help people understand and engage the world around them. News, factual programming, current affairs, documentary. Well, factual programming, current affairs, that is the Night Woman's Hour. Support learning for people of all ages, definitely an educational element to Late Night Woman's Hour can tick that box. To show the most creative, highest quality, distinctive output and services. Definitely high quality programming late night woman's hour. Ticks that box. It's distinctive because no one else is doing that kind of thing. To reflect, represent and serve diverse communities of all the United Kingdoms, nations and regions and in doing so support the creative economy across the United Kingdom. So England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Channel Islands, etc. Right? Does it do that? Yeah. To reflect the United Kingdom, its culture and values to the world. Does Late Night Woman's Hour do that? Well, only if somebody bored is listening to it. And what likelihood of that? Hmm. Well, slim to nil, I'd say. But, nonetheless, Late Night Woman's Hour as a product of Radio 4 
which itself is part of the BBC, this is a public service broadcaster, it fits nearly all of these categories. So, that shows you the kinds of things that we can talk about in terms of the institutional context of who the BBC are, and I've also looked at the technological context of the BBC and how its shows can be listened to, not just Late Night Warmers Hour, but including Late Night Warmers Hour. If you've got any questions, you know where I am, and I'll see you in the next one.